We've got a non-spoiler review for you of A Haunting in Venice. We wouldn't dream of spoiling it. We want you to go in fresh. We didn't know who the killer was. You shouldn't know either. Please. Uh, If if anybody (laughs) out there spoiling an Agatha Christie movie should be placed in the public stocks and have cabbages thrown at their head. We Uh, wouldn't dream of it. If you're not subscribed yet, though, we'd love it if you would, because we are going into fall movie season. All the big stuff is coming. All the things that played at the fall festivals, all the movies that had to get out of the way of Taylor Swift. They're all coming eventually. (laughs) We'll have reviews for you. So hit the button if you've not already. We'd love to see you. Alonzo, what is A Haunting in Venice about? The contrapas here. Somebody is dead. No one shall leave this place until I know who did it. So this is uh, Kenneth Branagh's third go-round, uh, playing Hercule Poirot and directing uh, an Agatha Christie adaptation. And uh, we we pick up with the character about 10 years after the end of a death, uh, death on the Nile. It's 1947. It's Venice. Everyone is still reeling from World War II, including Poirot. He feels adrift from the world. He is retired from, from being a detective. He's cut himself off from people and is just sort of generally emotionally numb. He gets a visit one day from his old friend Ariadne Oliver, a mystery novelist played by Tina Fey who says, look, there is this really popular psychic, and I'm sure she's a fake, but she's so good, I can't find what the fakey part is, so Mm -hmm. I want you to come help me expose her. And it turns out that very night in Venice, it's Halloween night, uh, the medium, played by Michelle Yeoh, is having a seance at the home of opera singer Kelly Riley, whose daughter died a year previous, and she's trying to contact her. Other people in the house include the PTSD suffering family doctor, played by Jamie Dornan, uh, his his young son, who basically is his caretaker, uh, played by Jude uh, Hill, the kid from uh, Belfast. Um is a reunion uh, for all of them in Belfast then. Uh, that's right. Well, that's right. I forget Dornan too. Yeah. Uh, the, and the, the Kenneth Branagh directed it. Right. Well, yeah, that, that was a given. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that part I knew. Thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, Camille Cotin from Call My Agent as the nanny, the former fiance of the uh, dead daughter, uh, Maxime, who is, there's so many people. So we played by Kyle Allen. And of course... Bodies start piling up, and only Poirot can figure out who did it, mm-hmm. and he has to sort of lock them all inside until he can crack the case. Um, <laughs> I have not been a fan of the two previous Poirot movies. Like, I love Poirot movies in general. Like, you know, Murder in the Orient Express, the original Death on the Nile, um, um, Evil Under the Sun, fun, cool, whodunits, all-star cast, the whole thing. The Brana ones I, I found a little bit airless, um, tons of green screen. At one point in Murder on the Orient Express, they're all sitting outside in the snow, and it's just like, no, you're not. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Death on the Nile, also super fakey. And it's funny, mm-hmm. before this movie started, I was talking to uh, our friend Gray Drake, because I had just gotten back from the Venice Film Festival. I was like, I don't know why this wasn't at that festival like they had a big right? billboard for it right by the 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 grand you know the red carpet but the it wasn't screening as part of the festival and she said well maybe they didn't film it there uh and i thought oh you're a good point but no they do they it they, looks like they did yeah they absolutely did there is tons mm-hmm. of like granular venice location going on in this movie so that already is uh, much better second of all uh, maybe the way for Branna to uh, adapt Agatha Christie is not to adapt Agatha Christie at all, because mm-hmm. Michael Green has supposedly adapted the novel Halloween Party. And apart from the fact that it's set on Halloween and there are characters with similar with same names as characters from the book, this is a completely original creation. This is not really an Agatha Christie adaptation at all. And that works to the film's favor, because... With Orient Express and Death on the Nile, everybody had seen those other movies, or most of us had, and we kind of went in knowing what to expect and knowing who the killers were going to be. This time, like, eh, you know, it's anybody's game. And so that makes it more exciting just automatically. And then Mm -hmm. on top of that, this is a really well done, atmospheric, creepy whodunit. It's real shadowy. I think the haunting not only applies to the palazzo where where Kelly Riley lives, but like so many of the characters are carrying this burden of grief, you know, sort of late forties Europe uh, Mm -hmm. that really kind of adds to the mood of the movie. Um, And I think Branagh makes some really great directorial choices. There's a, there's like a shadow puppet show early on that kind of tells the story of the, the ghosts that allegedly haunt this palazzo. And then it is mirrored later by a murder that takes place in silhouette. I'd say this is like the most fun Branna movie like just sort of 
shamelessly entertaining spinning a yarn since like dead again. Oh, wow. So I really sure enjoyed this. Yeah, <laughs> but I agree with all of that, but yeah. I'm not sure it's fun. I think it's it's chilling. I think well, it's very effective emotionally. And you mentioned, you know, just the the underlying sorrow here and the the feeling of just loss of security, of happiness, because it's post-war Italy here. That is an underpinning in the general sense. And then specifically, you have what occurred in this building over and over again, as far as the legend goes. Right. Um, so I thought... That was all very effective, but then in really specific ways with camera movements and just the use of, of silence a lot of times, like the score is very good. It's, mm -hmm. it's Hilda Goodner daughter, but the score is very good. But when it's just quiet, like there's a scene where they're all like pulling up to the palazzo early on mm. in their gondolas and you can hear nothing but like the, the lapping ripple. of the <laughs> waves against the sides of the boats and just you feel like you're in the boat and it's like anything could happen. There's a real feeling of dread yeah. down every corridor. Kenneth Branagh in the past has never met a canted angle he didn't like. <laughs> and that is quite frequently a big distraction. Like in his first Thor, like that, that mm. Thor, like, it's so distracting. Like every new scene begins with a candid angle to the extent that Nick is like, ah, enough with the candid angles already. But here it really works because it's so extreme. Yeah. Like looking up and there's like fish eye stuff going on too. Like looking up at doorways, like everything feels exaggerated and extreme in ways that are quite chilling and yeah. foreboding. And so that mood is very, very effective here. And everyone's really good in it. And um, so I'm not sure it's fun. Although there are moments well, that are thrilling. Like there's some, some stuff with Michelle Yeoh's character that is really exciting. Like high energy, really exciting stuff with her where you just don't know what's going to happen. Right. And that's cool. I mean, look, when I say fun, it's a murder mystery with the word haunting in the title. So, I mean, like, I think it's doing, as as our dear friend Matt would say, it does what it says on the box. Like, it is meant to be creepy and atmospheric and chilling. And so, yeah, it's not fun in, like, a knives out kind of way, necessarily. No. But I think it, it is, he is telling a story in a way that really is compelling and gives you those sort of, like, fun, creepy, murder mystery vibes. Yeah, the cast is terrific. I don't love Tina Fey in this. And it's not, not? because it's not because I don't like Tina Fey. I, I don't buy her as a period character. She just strikes me as so contemporary in so mm. many ways. And also that that role is a toughie where you have to be the sidekick of Poirot and like receive a lot of exposition and reaction shots and stuff. I think like she's too big a personality for mm. that. Like I think like the best the best version of that is Martin Balsam in in Murder on the Orient Express, the one with mm -hmm. with Albert Finney. Like he's mm -hmm. great at like at yes ending everything that Poirot was saying. And she is like, I don't know. I, I could I, I kind of felt like she was like bristling to like take center stage and she doesn't get to because that's not what the role calls for, you know. Oh, but she's doing the voice and everything. And what, she's yeah, kind of like, the, like a forties character. She's got the she, curls and everything. And yeah, you know. that and that's like unless you are Jennifer Jason Lee in the Hutsucker proxy, it's really hard to pull off that forties <laughs> like you know, Rosalind Russell voice in the new century, you know. But that's just I didn't think she was a distraction, but she does kind of feel a bit like she's in her own movie. Hey. And this did kind of remind me a bit of Glass Onion in that um, he's retired. He thinks mm, he's retired yes. and right. has to be pulled, quote unquote, pulled, right? Yeah. Clearly he misses the game and all that. But you get the sense of melancholy and being at sea. And then only once he is back in the setting again, does he really thrive and get to be Poirot and all, all of his greatness. So yeah, this is very good and, and scary. And as you say, fun in its own way. And <laughs> I did not know where it was going, but there are individual moments that are so startling that they really will stay with me, like stuff involving the kids on Halloween and just shadows. And mm -hmm. there's this real extremity here that's very effective. And so I thought and it's And just the, the whole sort of underlying mood of like Poirot saying early on, look, I don't believe in ghosts, but it would be great if there were, because then that would mean there's a soul. And if there's a soul, there's a God. But I don't believe there's a God based on everything I've seen over the last couple of decades. And it's like, yeah. That's pretty heavy for like a, you know, a murder <laughs> mystery, you know? So yeah. I, I was kind of digging that. And Jude Hill is so good in this. So good. So poised. That, that kid is just like focused. He's yeah. really, really terrific in this. But not annoyingly precocious. No, just like no, 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 solid. no, no, no. And also, but, and, and with an underlying sadness in the way that so many of the other characters have, like it's yeah. really effective. What's your number? I said seven and a half. I had a really good time with this. 
I say eight. I think your numbers <laughs> should be higher based on your rantings and ratings. I never know what the fuck with the numbers. Look, I liked it a lot. Go see it. Who cares okay. what my score was?